A Tempered Wind by O. Henry. The first time my optical nerves was disturbed by the sight of Buckingham Skinner was in Kansas City. I was standing on a corner when I see Buck stick his straw-colored head out of a third-story window of a business block and holler, Whoa there! Whoa! Like you would in endeavoring to assuage a team of runaway mules. I looked around, but all the animals I see in sight is a policeman, having his shoes shined, and a couple of delivery wagons hitched to posts. Then in a minute downstairs tumbles this Buckingham Skinner and runs to the corner and stands and gazes down the other street at the imaginary dust kicked up by the fabulous hoofs of the fictitious team of chimerical quadrupeds. And then B. Skinner goes back up to the third story room again. And I see that the lettering on the window is the Farmer's Friend Loan Company. By and by Strawtop comes down again, and I cross the street to meet him, for I had my ideas. Yes, sir. When I got close I could see where he overdone it. He was reub all right as far as his blue jeans and cowhide boots went, but he had a matinee actor's hands, and the rye straw stuck over his ear looked like it belonged to the property man of the old homestead company. Curiosity to know what his graft was got the best of me. Was that your team broke away and run just now? I asks him, polite. I tried to stop him, says I, but I couldn't. I guess they're halfway back to the farm by now. Gosh blame them darn mules, says Strawtop, in a voice so good that I nearly apologized. They're a loose bustin' loose. And then he looks at me close, and then he takes off his hayseed hat and says in a different voice, I'd like to shake hands with Parlevu Pickens, the greatest street man in the West, barring only Montague Silver, which you can no more than allow. I let him shake hands with me. I learned under Silver, I said, I don't begrudge him the lead. But what's your graft, son? I admit that the phantom flight of the non, existing animals at which you remarked, whoa, has puzzled me somewhat. How do you win out on the trick? Buckingham Skinner blushed. Pocket money, says he, that's all. I am temporarily unfinanced. This little coup de rye straw is good for $40 in a town of this size. How do I work it? Why, I involve myself, as you perceive, in the loathsome apparel of the rural dub. Thus embalmed I am Jonas Stubblefield A name impossible to improve upon. I repair noisily to the office of some loan company conveniently located in the third, floor, front. There I lay my hat and yarn gloves on the floor and ask to mortgage my farm for $2,000 to pay for my sister's musical education in Europe. Loans like that always suit the loan companies. It's ten to one that when the note falls due the foreclosure will be leading the semiquavers by a couple of lengths. Well, sir, I reach in my pocket for the abstract of title, but I suddenly hear my team running away. I run to the window and emit the word or exclamation, whichever it may be viz, whoa. Then I rush downstairs and down the street, returning in a few minutes. Dang the mules, I says. They done run away and busted the double tree and two traces. Now I got to hoof it home, for I never brought no money along. Reckon we'll talk about that loan some other time, Jen Lemon. Then I spreads out my tarpaulin, like the Israelites, and waits for the manna to drop. Why, no, Mr. Stubblefield, says the lobster-colored party in the specks and dotted peak vest. Oblige us by accepting this $10 bill until tomorrow. Get your harness repaired and call in at 10. We'll be pleased to accommodate you in the matter of this loan. It's a slight thing, says Buckingham Skinner, modest. But, as I said, only for temporary loose change. It's nothing to be ashamed of, says I, in respect for his mortification. In case of an emergency, of course, it's small compared to organizing a trust or bridge whist, but even the Chicago University had to be started in a small way. What's your graft these days? Buckingham Skinner asks me. The legitimate, says I. I'm handling rhinestones and Dr. Oleum Sinopi's electric headache battery and the Swiss Warbler's bird call, a small lot of the new queer ones and twos, and the Bonanza budget, consisting of a rolled gold wedding and engagement ring, six Egyptian lily bulbs, a combination pickle fork and nail clipper, and 50 engraved visiting cards no two names alike all for the sum of 38 cents. Two months ago, says Buckingham Skinner, I was doing well down in Texas with a patent instantaneous fire kindler made of compressed wood ashes and benzene. I sold loads of him in towns where they like to burn niggers quick, 
without having to ask somebody for a light. And just when I was doing the best, they strikes oil down there and puts me out of business. Your machine's too slow now, partner, they tells me. We can have a coon in hell with this here petroleum before your old flint and tinder truck can get him warm enough to profess religion. And so I gives up the kindler and drifts up here to KC. This little curtain raiser you seen me doing, Mr. Pickens, with the simulated farm and the hypothetical teams, ain't in my line at all, and I'm ashamed you found me working it. No man, says I, kindly, need to be ashamed of putting the ski bunk on a loan corporation for even so small a sum as ten dollars when he is financially abashed. Still, it wasn't quite the proper thing. It's too much like borrowing money without paying it back. I liked Buckingham Skinner from the start, for as good a man as ever stood over the axles and breathed gasoline smoke. And pretty soon we gets thick, and I let him in on a scheme I'd had in mind for some time, and offers to go partners. Anything, says Buck, that is not actually dishonest will find me willing and ready. Let us perforate into the inwardness of your proposition. I feel degraded when I am forced to wear property straw in my hair and assume a bucolic air for the small sum of ten dollars. Actually, Mr. Pickens, it makes me feel like the Ophelia of the great Occidental All-Star One-Night Consolidated Theatrical Aggregation. This scheme of mine was one that suited my proclivities. By nature, I am some sentimental, and have always felt gentle toward the mollifying elements of existence. I am disposed to be lenient with the arts and sciences, and I find time to instigate a cordiality for the more human works of nature, such as romance and the atmosphere and grass and poetry and the seasons. I never skin a sucker without admiring the prismatic beauty of his scales. I never sell a little auriferous beauty to the man with the hoe without noticing the beautiful harmony there is between gold and green. And that's why I liked this scheme. It was so full of outdoor air and landscapes and easy money. We had to have a young lady assistant to help us work this graft. And I asked Buck if he knew of one to fill the bill. One, says I, that is cool and wise and strictly business from her pompadour to her Oxfords. No ex-toe dancers or gum chewers or crayon portrait canvassers for this. Buck claimed he knew a suitable feminine, and he takes me around to see Miss Sarah Malloy. The minute I see her I am pleased. She looked to be the goods as ordered. No sign of the three Ps about her no peroxide, patchouli, nor peau de soie. About twenty-two, brown hair, pleasant ways, the kind of a lady for the place. A description of the sandbag, if you please, she begins. Why, ma'am, says I, this graft of ours is so nice and refined and romantic, it would make the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet look like second-story work. We talked it over, and Miss Malloy agreed to come in as a business partner. She said she was glad to get a chance to give up her place as stenographer and secretary to a suburban lot company and go into something respectable. This is the way we worked our scheme. First, I figured it out by a kind of a proverb. The best graphs in the world are built up on copy, book maxims and psalms and proverbs and Esau's fables. They seem to kind of hit off human nature. Our peaceful little swindle was constructed on the old saying, the whole push loves a lover. One evening Buck and Miss Malloy drives up like blazes in a buggy to a farmer's door. She is pale but affectionate, clinging to his arm. Always clinging to his arm. Anyone can see that she is a peach and of the cling variety. They claim they are eloping for to be married on account of cruel parents. They ask where they can find a preacher. Farmer says, gum there ain't any preacher nigher than Reverend Abel's, for miles over on Connie Creek. Farmeress wipes her hand on her apron and rubbers through her specks. Then, lo and look ye, up the road from the other way jogs Parlevu Pickens in a gig, dressed in black, white necktie, long face, sniffing his nose, emitting a spurious kind of noise resembling the long meter doxology. Jinx, says Farmer, if there ain't a preacher now. It transpires that I am Reverend Abijah Green, traveling over to Little Bethel Schoolhouse for to preach next Sunday. The young folks will have it they must be married, for Pa is pursuing them with the plow mules and the buckboard. So the Reverend Green, after hesitating, marries M in the farmer's parlor. And Farmer grins and has insider and says, Gum! And Farmeress sniffles a bit and pats the bride on the shoulder. And Parlevu Pickens, the wrong Reverend, writes out a marriage certificate 
and farmer and farmeress sign it as witnesses, and the parties of the first, second, and third part gets in their vehicles and rides away. Oh, that was an idyllic graft. True love and the lowing kind and the sun shining on the red barns certainly had all other impostures I know about beat to a batter. I suppose I happened along in time to marry Buck and Miss Malloy at about twenty farmhouses. I hated to think how the romance was going to fade later on when all the marriage certificates turned up in banks where we discounted him, and the farmers had to pay them notes of hand they'd signed, running from three hundred dollars to five hundred dollars. On the fifteenth day of May us three divided about six thousand dollars. Miss Malloy nearly cried with joy. You don't often see a tender-hearted girl, or one that is bent on doing right. Boys, says she, dabbing her eyes with a little handkerchief. This state comes in handier than a powder rag at a fat men's ball. It gives me a chance to reform. I was trying to get out of the real estate business when you fellows came along. But if you hadn't taken me in on this neat little proposition for removing the cuticle of the rutabaga propagators, I'm afraid I'd have got into something worse. I was about to accept a place in one of these women's auxiliary bazaars, where they build a parsonage by selling a spoonful of chicken salad and a cream, puff for 75 cents and calling it a businessman's lunch. Now I can go into a square, honest business and give all them queer jobs the shake. I'm going to Cincinnati and start a palm reading and clairvoyant joint. As Madame Ceramaloy, the Egyptian sorceress, I shall give everybody a dollar's worth of good honest prognostication. Goodbye, boys. Take my advice and go into some decent fake. Get friendly with the police and newspapers, and you'll be all right. So then we all shook hands, and Miss Malloy left us. Me and Buck also rose up and sauntered off a few hundred miles, for we didn't care to be around when the marriage certificates fell due. With about $4,000 between us, we hit that bumptious little town off the New Jersey coast they call New York. If there ever was an aviary overstocked with jays, it is that yap town, on the Hudson. Cosmopolitan, they call it. You bet. So's a piece of flypaper. You listen close when they're buzzing and trying to pull their feet out of the sticky stuff. Little old New York's good enough for us. That's what they sing. There's enough reubs walk down Broadway in one hour to buy up a week's output of the factory in Augusta, Maine, that makes naughty novelties and the little fine foam oroide gold finger ring that sticks a needle in your friend's hand. You'd think New York people was all wise, but no, they don't get a chance to learn. Everything's too compressed. Even the hayseeds are baled hayseeds. But what else can you expect from a town that's shut off from the world by the ocean on one side and New Jersey on the other? It's no place for an honest grafter with a small capital. There's too big a protective tariff on Bunko. Even when Giovanni sells a quart of warm worms and chestnut hulls, he has to hand out a pint to an insectivorous cop. And the hotel man charges double for everything in the bill that he sends by the patrol wagon to the altar where the duke is about to marry the heiress. But old Badville near Coney is the ideal burg for a refined piece of piracy if you can pay the bunco duty. Imported grafts come pretty high. The custom house officers that look after it carry clubs, and it's hard to smuggle in even a bib and tucker swindle to work Brooklyn with unless you can pay the toll. But now, me and Buck, having capital, descends upon New York to try and trade the Metropolitan Backwoodsmen a few glass beads for real estate, just as the Vans did a hundred or two years ago. At an East Side hotel, we gets acquainted with Romulus G. Atterbury, a man with the finest head for financial operations I ever saw. It was all bald and glossy except for gray side whiskers. Seeing that head behind an office railing, and you'd deposit a million with it without a receipt. This Atterbury was well-dressed, though he ate seldom. And the synopsis of his talk would make the conversation of a siren sound like a cab driver's kick. He said he used to be a member of the stock exchange, but some of the big capitalists got jealous and formed a ring that forced him to sell his seat. Atterbury got to liking me and Buck, and he begun to throw on the canvas for us some of the schemes that had caused his hair to evacuate. He had one scheme for starting a national bank on $45 that made the Mississippi bubble look as solid as a glass marble. He talked this to us for three days, and when his throat was good and sore, we told him about the role we had. Atterbury borrowed a quarter from us and went out and got a box of throat lozenges and started all over again. This time he talked bigger things, and he got us to see him as he did. The scheme he laid out looked like a sure winner, and he talked me and Buck into putting our capital against his burnished dome of thought. It looked all right for a kid-gloved graft. 
It seemed to be just about an inch and a half outside of the reach of the police and as money-making as a mint. It was just what me and Buck wanted, regular business at a permanent stand, with an open air spieling with tonsillitis on the street corners every evening. So, in six weeks, you see a handsome furnished set of offices down in the Wall Street neighborhood with the Golconda Gold Bond and Investment Company in gilt letters on the door. And you see in his private room, with the door open, the secretary and treasurer, Mr. Buckingham Skinner, costumed like the lilies of the conservatory, with his high silk hat close to his hand. Nobody yet ever saw Buck outside of an instantaneous reach for his hat. And you might perceive the president and general manager, Mr. R. G. Atterbury, with his priceless polished pole, busy in the main office room dictating letters to a shorthand countess, who has got pomp and a pompadour that is no less than a guarantee to investors. There is a bookkeeper and an assistant, and a general atmosphere of varnish and culpability. At another desk the eye is relieved by the sight of an ordinary man, attired with unscrupulous plainness, sitting with his feet up, eating apples, with his obnoxious hat on the back of his head. That man is no other than Colonel Tecumseh, once Parlevu, Pickens, the vice president of the company. No recherche rags for me, I says to Atterbury, when we was organizing the stage properties of the robbery. I'm a plain man, says I, and I do not use pajamas, French, or military hairbrushes. Cast me for the role of the rhinestone in the rough, or I don't go on exhibition. If you can use me in my natural, though displeasing form, do so. Dress you up, says Atterbury, I should say not. Just as you are you're worth more to the business than a whole roomful of the things they pin chrysanthemums on. You're to play the part of the solid but disheveled capitalist from the far west. You despise the conventions. You've got so many stocks you can afford to shake socks. Conservative, homely, rough, shrewd, saving that's your pose. It's a winner in New York. Keep your feet on the desk and eat apples. Whenever anybody comes and eat an apple, let him see you stuff the peelings in a drawer of your desk. Look as economical and rich and rugged as you can. I followed out Atterbury's instructions. I played the Rocky Mountain capitalist without ruching or frills. The way I deposited apple peelings to my credit in a drawer when any customers came and made Hetty Green look like a spinthrift. I could hear Atterbury saying to victims, as he smiled at me, indulgent and venerating, that's our vice president, Colonel Pickens, fortune in Western investments, delightfully plain manners, but could sign his check for half a million, simple as a child, wonderful head, conservative and careful almost to a fault. Atterbury managed the business. Me and Buck never quite understood all of it, though he explained it to us in full. It seems the company was a kind of cooperative one, and everybody that bought stock shared in the profits. First, we officers bought up a controlling interest we had to have that of the shares at 50 cents a hundred, just what the printer charged us, and the rest went to the public at a dollar each. The company guaranteed the stockholders a profit of 10% each month, payable on the last day thereof. When any stockholder had paid in as much as $100, the company issued him a gold bond and he became a bondholder. I asked Atterbury one day what benefits and appurtenances these gold bonds was to an investor more so than the immunities and privileges enjoyed by the common sucker who only owned stock. Atterbury picked up one of them gold bonds, all gilt and lettered up with flourishes and a big red seal tied with a blue ribbon in a bow knot. And he looked at me like his feelings was hurt. My dear Colonel Pickens, says he, you have no soul for art. Think of a thousand homes made happy by possessing one of these beautiful gems of the lithographer's skill. Think of the joy in the household where one of these gold bonds hangs by a pink cord to the whatnot, or is chewed by the baby, caroling gleefully upon the floor. Ah, I see your eye growing moist. Colonel, I have touched you. Have I not? You have not, says I, for I've been watching you. The moisture you see is apple juice. You can't expect one man to act as a human cider, press, and an art connoisseur too. Atterbury attended to the details of the concern. As I understand it, they was simple. The investors in stock paid in their money and, well, I guess that's all they had to do. The company received it and I don't call to mind anything else. Me and Buck knew more about selling corn salve than we did about Wall Street, but even we could see how the Golconda Gold Bond Investment Company was making money. 
You take in money and pay back 10% of it. It's plain enough that you make a clean, legitimate profit of 90%, less expenses, as long as the fish bite. Atterbury wanted to be president and treasurer too, but Buck winks an eye at him and says, you was to furnish the brains. Do you call it good brain work when you propose to take in money at the door? Two, think again. I hereby nominate myself treasurer ad valorem, signed I, and by acclamation. I chip in that much brain work free. Me and Pickens, we furnish the capital, and we'll handle the unearned increment as it incremates. It costs us $500 for office rent and first payment on furniture. $1,500 more went for printing and advertising. Atterbury knew his business. Three months to a minute will last, says he. A day longer than that, and we'll have to either go under or go under an alias. By that time, we ought to clean up $60,000. And then a money belt and a lower berth for me. And the yellow journals and the furniture men can pick the bones. Our ads. Done the work. Country weeklies and Washington hand press dailies, of course, says I when we was ready to make contracts. Man, says Atterbury, as its advertising manager, you would cause a Limburger cheese factory to remain undiscovered during a hot summer. The game we're after is right here in New York and Brooklyn and the Harlem reading rooms. They're the people that the streetcar fenders and the answers to correspondence columns and the pickpocket notices are made for. We want our ads. In the biggest city dailies, top of column, next to editorials on radium and pictures of the girl doing health exercises. Pretty soon the money begins to roll in. Buck didn't have to pretend to be busy. His desk was piled high up with money orders and checks and greenbacks. People began to drop in the office and buy stock every day. Most of the shares went in small amounts, $10 and $25 and $50, and a good many $2 and $3 lots. And the bald and inviolate cranium of President Atterbury shines with enthusiasm and demerit, while Colonel Tecumseh Pickens, the rude but reputable Croesus of the West, consumes so many apples that the peelings hang to the floor from the mahogany garbage chest that he calls his desk. Just as Atterbury said, we ran along about three months without being troubled. Buck cashed the paper as fast as it came in and kept the money in a safe deposit vault a block or so away. Buck never thought much of banks for such purposes. We paid the interest regular on the stock we'd sold, so there was nothing for anybody to squeal about. We had nearly $50,000 on hand, and all three of us had been living as high as prize fighters out of training. One morning, as me and Buck sauntered into the office, fat and flippant, from our noon grub, we met an easy-looking fellow, with a bright eye and a pipe in his mouth, coming out. We found Atterbury looking like he'd been caught a mile from home in a wet shower. Know that man? He asked us. We said we didn't. I don't either, says Atterbury, wiping off his head. But I'll bet enough gold bonds to paper a cell in the tombs that he's a newspaper reporter. What did he want? Asks Buck. Information, says our president. Said he was thinking of buying some stock. He asked me about 900 questions, and every one of him hit some sore place in the business. I know he's on a paper. You can't fool me. You see a man about half shabby, with an eye like a gimlet, smoking cut plug, with dandruff on his coat collar, and knowing more than J, P, Morgan and Shakespeare put together if that ain't a reporter I never saw one. I was afraid of this. I don't mind detectives and post office inspectors. I talk to him eight minutes and then sell him stock, but them reporters take the starch out of my collar. Boys, I recommend that we declare a dividend and fade away. The signs point that way. Me and Buck talked to Atterbury and got him to stop sweating and stand still. That fellow didn't look like a reporter to us. Reporters always pull out a pencil and tablet on you and tell you a story you've heard and strikes you for the drinks. But Atterbury was shaky and nervous all day. The next day me and Buck comes down from the hotel about 10.30. On the way we buys the papers and the first thing we see is a column on the front page about our little imposition. It was a shame the way that reporter intimated that we were no blood relatives of the late George W. Childs. He tells all about the scheme as he sees it, in a rich, racy kind of a guying style that might amuse most anybody except a stockholder. Yes, Atterbury was right. It behooveth the gaily clad treasurer and the pearly pated president and the rugged vice president of the Golconda Gold Bond and Investment Company to go away real sudden and quick that their days might be longer upon the land. Me and Buck hurries down to the office. 
We finds on the stairs and in the hall a crowd of people trying to squeeze into our office, which is already jammed full inside to the railing. They've nearly all got Golconda stock and gold bonds in their hands. Me and Buck judged they'd been reading the papers, too. We stopped and looked at our stockholders, some surprised. It wasn't quite the kind of a gang we supposed had been investing. They all looked like poor people. There was plenty of old women and lots of young girls that you'd say worked in factories and mills. Some was old men that looked like were veterans, and some was crippled, and a good many was just kids boot blacks and newsboys and messengers. Some was working men in overalls, with their sleeves rolled up. Not one of the gang looked like a stockholder in anything unless it was a peanut stand. But they all had Golconda stock and looked as sick as you please. I saw a queer kind of a pale look come on Buck's face when he sized up the crowd. He stepped up to a sickly looking woman and says, Madam, do you own any of this stock? I put in a hundred dollars, says the woman, faint like. It was all I had saved in a year. One of my children is dying at home now and I haven't a cent in the house. I came to see if I could draw out some. The circulars said you could draw it at any time. But they say now I will lose it all. There was a smart kind of kid in the gang I guess he was a newsboy. I got in 25, mister, he says, looking hopeful at Buck's silk hat and clothes. Day paid me 250 a month on it. Say, a man tells me day can't do dat and be on to square. Is that straight? Do you guess I can get out my 25? Some of the old women was crying. The factory girls was plumb distracted. They lost all their savings, and they'd be docked for the time they lost coming to see about it. There was one girl, a pretty one in a red shawl, crying in a corner like her heart would dissolve. Buck goes over and asks her about it. It ain't so much losing the money, mister, says she, shaking all over. Though I've been two years saving it up, but Jakey won't marry me now. He'll take Rosa Steinfeld. I know JJ Jakey. She's got $400 in the savings bank. I, I, I trattino she sings out. Buck looks all around with that same funny look on his face. And then we see leaning against the wall, puffing at his pipe, with his eyes shining at us, this newspaper reporter. Buck and me walks over to him. You're a real interesting writer, says Buck. How far do you mean to carry it? Anything more up your sleeve? Oh, I'm just waiting around, says the reporter smoking away. In case any news turns up, it's up to your stockholders now. Some of them might complain, you know. Isn't that the patrol wagon now? He says, listening to a sound outside. No, he goes on. That's document Whittleford's old cadaver coop from the Roosevelt. I ought to know that gong. Yes, I suppose I've written some interesting stuff at times. You wait, says Buck. I'm going to throw an item of news in your way. Buck reaches in his pocket, and hands me a key. I knew what he meant before he spoke. Confounded old buccaneer, I knew what he meant. They don't make them any better than Buck. Pick, says he, looking at me hard. Ain't this graft a little out of our line? Do we want Jakey to marry Rosa Steinfeld? You've got my vote, says I. I'll have it here in 10 minutes. And I starts for the safe deposit vaults. I comes back with the money done up in a big bundle. And then Buck and me takes the journalist reporter around to another door and we let ourselves into one of the office rooms. Now, my literary friend, says Buck, take a chair and keep still and I'll give you an interview. You see before you two grafters from Graftersville, Grafter County, Arkansas. Me and Pick have sold brass jewelry, hair tonic, songbooks, marked cards, patent medicines, Connecticut Smyrna rugs, furniture polish, and albums in every town from Old Point Comfort to the Golden Gate. We've grafted a dollar whenever we saw one that had a surplus look to it. But we never went after the simoleon in the toe of the sock, under the loose brick in the corner of the kitchen hearth. There's an old saying you may have heard, fussily decency of Ernie, which means it's an easy slide from the street faker's dry goods box to a desk in Wall Street. We've took that slide, but we didn't know exactly what was at the bottom of it. Now, you ought to be wise, but you ain't. You've got New York wiseness, which means that you judge a man by the outside of his clothes. That ain't right. You ought to look at the lining and seams and the button. Holes. While we are waiting for the patrol wagon, you might get out your little stub pencil and take notes for another funny piece in the paper. And then Buck turns to me and says, I don't care what Atterbury thinks. He only put in brains, and if he gets his capital out, he's lucky. But what do you say, Pick? 
Me? Says I. You ought to know me, Buck. I didn't know who was buying this stock. All right, says Buck. And then he goes through the inside door into the main office and looks at the gang trying to squeeze through the railing. Atterbury and his hat was gone. And Buck makes him a short speech. All you lambs get in line. You're going to get your wool back. Don't shove so. Get in a line A slash line slash, not in a pile. Lady, will you please stop bleeding? Your money's waiting for you. Here, Sonny, don't climb over that railing. Your dimes are safe. Don't cry, sis. You ain't out a cent get in slash line slash, I say. Here, pick. Come and straighten him out and let him through and out by the other door. Buck takes off his coat, pushes his silk hat on the back of his head, and lights up a rain of Victoria. He sets at the table with the boodle before him, all done up in neat packages. I gets the stockholders strung out and marches him, single file, through from the main room, and the reporter man passes him out of the side door into the hall again. As they go by, Buck takes up the stock and the gold bonds, paying him cash, dollar for dollar, the same as they paid in. The shareholders of the Golconda Gold Bond and Investment Company can't hardly believe it. They almost grabs the money out of Buck's hands. Some of the women keep on crying, for it's a custom of the sex to cry when they have sorrow, to weep when they have joy, and to shed tears whenever they find themselves without either. The old women's fingers shake when they stuff the scads in the bosom of their rusty dresses. The factory girls just stoop over and flap their dry goods a second, and you hear the elastic go pop as the currency goes down in the ladies' department of the old domestic Lyle Thread Bank. Some of the stockholders that had been doing the Jeremiah act the loudest outside had spasms of restored confidence and wanted to leave the money invested. Salt away that chicken feed in your duds and skip along, says Buck. What business have you got investing in bonds? The teapot or the crack in the wall behind the clock for your hoard of pennies? When the pretty girl in the red shawl cashes in Buck hands her an extra twenty. A wedding present, says our treasurer, from the Golconda Company, and say if Jakey ever follows his nose, even at a respectful distance, around the corner where Rosa Steinfeld lives, you are hereby authorized to knock a couple of inches of it off. When they was all paid off and gone, Buck calls the newspaper reporter and shoves the rest of the money over to him. You begun this, says Buck. Now finish it. Over there are the books, showing every share and bond issued. Here's the money to cover, except what we've spent to live on. You'll have to act as receiver. I guess you'll do the square thing on account of your paper. This is the best way we know how to settle it. Me and our substantial but apple-weary vice president are going to follow the example of our revered president and skip. Now, have you got enough news for today? Or do you want to interview us on etiquette and the best way to make over an old taffeta skirt? News, says the newspaper man, taking his pipe out. Do you think I could use this? I don't want to lose my job. Suppose I go around to the office and tell him this happened. While the managing editor say, he'll just hand me a pass to Bellevue and tell me to come back when I get cured. I might turn in a story about a sea serpent wiggling up Broadway, but I haven't got the nerve to try him with a pipe like this. A get-rich-quick scheme excuse me gang giving back the boodle. Oh no, I'm not on the comic supplement. You can't understand it, of course, says Buck, with his hand on the doorknob. Me and Pick ain't Wall Streeters like you know him. We never allowed to swindle sick old women and working girls and take nickels off of kids. In the lines of graft we've worked we took money from the people the Lord made to be buncoed sports and rounders and smart alecks and street crowds that always have a few dollars to throw away and farmers that would never be happy if the grafters didn't come around and play with them when they sold their crops. We never cared to fish for the kind of suckers that bite here. No, sir. We got too much respect for the profession and for ourselves. Goodbye to you, Mr. Receiver. Here, says the journalist reporter. Wait a minute. There's a broker I know on the next floor. Wait till I put this truck in his safe. I want you fellows to take a drink on me before you go. On you, says Buck, winking solemn. Don't you go and try to make em believe at the office you said that. Thanks. We can't spare the time, I reckon. So long. And me and Buck slides out the door. And that's the way the Golconda Company went into involuntary liquefaction. If you had seen me and Buck the next night, you'd have had to go to a little bum hotel over near the west side ferry landings. We was in a little back room, 
and I was filling up a gross of six ounce bottles with hydrant water colored red with aniline and flavored with cinnamon. Buck was smoking, contented, and he wore a decent brown derby in place of his silk hat. It's a good thing, Pick, says he, as he drove in the corks, that we got Brady to lend us his horse and wagon for a week. We'll rustle up the stake by then. This hair tonical cell, right along over in Jersey. Bald heads ain't popular over there on account of the mosquitoes. Directly I dragged out my valise and went down in it for labels. Hair tonic labels are out, says I, only about a dozen on hand. Buy some more, says Buck. We investigated our pockets and found we had just enough money to settle our hotel bill in the morning and pay our passage over the ferry. Plenty of the shake the shakes chill cure labels, says I, after looking. What more do you want, says Buck. Slopping on. The chill season is just opening up in the Hackensack low grounds. What's hair, anyway, if you have to shake it off? We posted on the chill cure labels about half an hour and Buck says. Making an honest living's better than that Wall Street. Anyhow, ain't it, Pick? You bet, says I.